Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Oxford Centre of Hindu Studies. I'm very pleased to welcome back uh, Professor June McDaniel. Um, Professor McDaniel is Professor Emerita of, in the History of Religions of the Department of Religious Studies at the College of Charleston. She did her PhD from the University of Chicago and her MTS was from Emory University. And her research areas include mysticism, religions of India, psychology of religion, women in religion, and ritual studies. She did several years of field research in West Bengal and are funded by the Fulbright Scholarship and the American Institute for Indian Studies, uh, which focus on religious experience and modern Shaktism. And she's published several books on these topics, including Lost Ecstasy, Its Decline and Transformation in Religion, Offering Flowers, Feeding Skulls, Popular Goddess Worship in West Bengal, Making Virtuous Daughters into Wives, An Introduction to Bratta Rituals of Bengal, The Madness of the Saints, Ecstatic Religion in Bengal, and she's edited some books as well, including Religious Experience in the Hindu Tradition. So, and her current work draws on um, comparisons between Bengali and Balinese Hinduism and examines religious emotion in different traditions. So I'm a great fan of um, Professor McDaniel's work and I'm so pleased that she's able to talk to us today uh, on this topic. So uh, June, over to you. Hello. Okay, the study of Shaktism is a relatively new field and its primary methodologies have been historical and textual study. In this lecture, we'll examine a different approach to Shaktism from the perspectives of practitioners and devotees. The regional focus will be West Bengal, India. Geographically, Shaktism or goddess worship in India has primarily been of two types, the South Indian worship of the goddess Sri or Lakshmi and the North Indian worship of the goddess Kali. These types have different values and rituals and they emphasize different goddesses or different forms of the same goddess depending on the theology. The first type located primarily in Southern India sees the goddess as the embodiment of good fortune, fertility, and wealth, and respects the Brahmanical tradition, the mainstream Hindu tradition, which emphasizes caste and purity. It tends to follow the classical approach with the knowledge of and respect for scriptures. Shri is a goddess of blessing and auspiciousness in the Shri Kul. The second type is found mostly in Northern and Eastern India, especially in West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, and Orissa. The focus of this Kali Kul lineage is on the goddess as the source of wisdom and liberation. It has a complex relationship with the Brahmanical tradition, which many of its practitioners understand to be overly conservative and rejecting the experiential aspects of religion in favor of scholarship and social status. Practitioners whom I've interviewed often claim to be all Shastriya, finding scripture to be only a beginning of deeper knowledge of the divine. Kali, Tara, and sometimes Durga are the main forms of the goddess in this tradition. There are the 10 different forms that are worshiped. The 10 Mahavidyas are great wisdom figures. There's also worship of both local and pan-Indian goddesses who are described in stories written in colloquial Bengali and in Sanskrit sacred texts. All of them may be understood as aspects of Shakti, the feminine power of creation and transformation. There are many origin stories of the goddesses and the Puranas and they tend to include opposite aspects of the goddess, light and dark, creative and destructive. The black or fierce nature included such goddesses as Kali, Durga, Chandi, Chamunda, Bhadrakali, and Bhairavi, while the white or peaceful nature included Uma, Gauri, Parvati, Maheshwari, Lalita, and Annapurna. In her peaceful form, the goddess's wife, mother, and daughter, loving, supportive, loving and supportive of her husband, while the fierce forms tend to have the goddesses independent, often creating and destroying worlds, the mild forms portray a nurturing and sympathetic goddess. Theologically, understandings of the identity and origin of the goddess differ. Some Shakta traditions say all goddesses are manifestations of the same goddess, Adi Shakti or Parama Shakti. While others say that the many goddesses are separate and unique, or sometimes they're manifestations of one or more gods. There are several philosophical schools within Shaktism. There's Shakta monism, in which all phenomena are parts of the goddess whose deepest nature is Brahman or universal consciousness. Then there's Shakta monotheism, in which there's a single great goddess who's created the universe and can use to have power over it. 
They are shocked at polytheism in which many goddesses have different sorts of powers or specializations and sometimes compete for status and devotees with other goddesses or with male gods. And they're shocked to henotheism where many goddesses are recognized as legitimate but one goddess is the most powerful and dominant. Monism, monotheism, polytheism, henotheism, all of these are legitimate positions in Shaktism, and each is widely held, and sometimes more than one position is held at a time. They hold different theologies and due to the existence of several approaches to the religion. Shaktism is a vast maze of belief systems and practices. How shall we begin to understand it? From my perspective, looking at their major types is the easiest and clearest way to study them. So we will look at these a bit more closely. Folk or tribal Shaktism. The first and oldest type or strand of Shaktism is found in the rural areas of India, which we can call folk Shaktism. It is widespread among the Adivasi, a term which many tribal groups prefer to call themselves today. It involves the worship of both tribal goddesses, often in the form of the Buri, the old woman or ancestress, and local Hindu goddesses who have revealed themselves to villagers, often present as rocks or in other natural objects. There's no sharp line between tribal and Hindu goddesses, and villagers often, villagers often worship both types at the same altar. These goddesses are amoral and often dangerous, but once they're shown respect, they become benevolent and they're willing to help the worshipers. Sometimes such goddesses begin as unhappy women who've died by violence, and later worship balances out their previous bad treatment and renders them harmless. But if they're not fed, their supernatural bodies starve and they will curse those they consider to be responsible. They require obedience more than love. These goddesses are usually associated with the group or tribe rather than the individual. They're also usually regional goddesses rather than pan-Indian ones, though pan-Indian names may be used for village deities. Sometimes the goddesses are competitive the Kali of one village is not necessarily the Kali of another village. They may even be rivals. Folk Shaktism is practical, where the goddess is worshiped for her gifts of healing and fertility, for children and crops, and invoked for cases of barrenness, disease, and danger. The village religious specialist may be a headman or a non-Brahman priest or priestess, as well as a trance medium. They learn how to contact the goddess and become a channel for her personality. In tribal areas, the specialist is usually a person trained in invoking deities and in magical healing, the Oja Ogunan. More informally, traditions of worship and contact with the goddess may be taught by the older women of the community, especially through brats, or in Sanskrit brats, the vows and minor ascetic practices primarily performed by women and girls to gain blessings. In more urban areas, the poor lady is a professional medium who gets possessed, usually by Kali. The folk or tribal strand could also be called the shamanic strand as its ritual specialists, Uja and Nagunan, function in many similar ways to those described in the literature on shamanism. However, shamanism is a disputed term these days. Mercha Eliade's shamanic complex included initiation with illness, solitude, ordeals, apparitions, and death and rebirth experience, magical flight and descent into the underworld, communication with spirits and guardian deities, and abilities at spiritual healing and the guiding of souls. The ritual specialists of folk shaktism are believed to have several of these abilities and experiences. They're initiated by practitioners in solitude, in the burning ground or the forest at midnight, and they have visions of both ghosts and the goddess. They gain power over spirits, sometimes using a bone from a corpse or some other magical object. They have control over trance states, in which they communicate with ancestors and deities, and they have magical powers, including healing, control of the weather, and fertility. In these ways, they follow the shamanic complex. However, they generally do not undergo illness, death, and rebirth, though this does sometimes happen, and it's associated with periods of both madness and bad luck from curses or from the planets. They do not always fly into heavens or hells or guide the souls of the dead, though there may be a confrontation with the deity associated with death. In these ways, they would not fit Eliade's qualifications for shaman. In folk shaktism, the goddess may be worshiped in several forms. For example, she may be the tribal Kali, dark and powerful, the hunter's goddess Chandi or Mangal Chandi, Manisha the snake goddess or Shitala the smallpox goddess, who also became the AIDS goddess and more recently the COVID goddess as Corona Mai or Corona Devi. She may also be worshiped as a variety of village goddesses, Grama Devis, powerful mothers, matrikas, or yoginis. 
These last forms have an ambiguous nature, sometimes dangerous and threatening, sometimes protective. She may appear as an old woman whose knowledge is reflected in her years, as well as the forms of mother and warrior. As mother, she grants fertility and happiness. As warrior, she grants protection from death and threat. As old woman, she teaches tribal traditions and gives revelations. The goddess in the folk strand may descend in possession trance or in disease. The disease itself may be understood as the goddess's presence. And she may become ritually present in sacrifices and offerings. She shows herself in dreams and visions, often issuing commands to her future devotees. The dream command is a major way that goddess statues are found and shrines begun. She may also manifest in natural settings as sacred rocks, springs, or openings for jets of steam. The goddess is not a transcendent being living in a distant heaven, but rather one who lives within nature and can be contacted there. In folklore, there are often strong female devotees who come to be regarded as minor goddesses. While the goddess acts through individuals, her major focus in this strand is usually the village, tribal, or clan group. Folk Tantra is primarily an oral tradition handed down from village elders or priests or from guru to disciple. This is partly because many of the village people who become priests or healers are illiterate, and partly because the direct transmission of power and direct experience of the goddess are decisive parts of the instruction. Encounter with the goddess may occur in dream or vision, or in rare occasions results from reading books. However, for many villagers, books have a negative association. They're Vermonical and they support caste oppression. Traditions of goddess worship are handed down in family and village groups. They may incorporate some elements of more mainstream Hinduism, such as Sanskrit mantras, depending on the degree of Hindu influence within the group. We may note that while social, economic, and political styles differ between these tribal and village Hindu groups, there are similar worship of similar deities, ancestors, local deities, pan-Indian deities, for similar reasons, worldly happiness, wealth, health, and fertility, avoidance of bad luck, etc. Both are concerned with divine power and both hope to bless their lives with it. Some deities are shared by tribal religion and village Hinduism, such as Durga, Kali, and Manasha. There are tribal shelters for deities, which are basically small temples and places of worship, as well as Hindu deities worshiped in nature, such as the Durga worshiped by North Bengali Hindus in the form of a great tree surrounded by flags. For example, the goddess Chandi is worshiped by both groups. Chandi Banga is a Santal deity, the Mangal Chandi is a Hindu one, and both bless the fields when they are offered food and valuables. There are also similarities with folk tantra. We may note that both tribal ojas and shakta tantrics have initiation at the burning ground, hoping for a gift of power. Tantric yogic shaktism. The second form or strand is that of the tantric or yogic shaktism. Its origins are debated, but there are tantric elements from writings of the sixth century CE and major texts calling themselves tantras written by the 8th century CE. In the Shakta Tantric strand, the goddess is reached by meditation and visualization and by tantric ritual worship, making use of tantric mantras, mudras, and imagery. Yogic practice is often involved, especially Kundalini yoga. There are two subtypes, which we might call folk and or popular tantra and classical or scholastic tantra. In folk tantra, the emphasis is on ritual practice, direct experience, and pragmatic results. The goddess gives supernatural abilities, siddhis, and power, or shakti, and she appears to the practitioner in the forest or burning ground. She may also be ritually located in the human body by the practice of nyasa, or nash in the Bengali, in which deities are visualized in parts of the body. She may appear as a beautiful woman or a frightening warrioress, and grant boons to the practitioner in exchange for worship. The folk tantric, male or female, invokes the goddess and may temporarily merge with her or her consort Shiva or be possessed by both of them. Traditionally, the folk tantric sits at the burning ground or other deserted locales performing tantric worship. He or she may empower amulets, offer animal sacrifices, and call on the souls of the dead. The path often involves violation of traditional norms. <clears throat> and the conquest of instinctual fears and desires. When the folk tantric shows that he or she has conquered fear, especially the fear of death, the goddess may then descend and give gifts, including knowledge and liberation. He or she is usually isolated, occasionally keeping in touch with his own guru or guru pais, others initiated by the guru, 
or meeting at set times with others in a chakra, a tantric circle of ritual participants. Practitioners are usually renunciants. Folk tantra is largely based on oral tradition or apprenticeships, and the term tantra refers primarily to a practice or sadhana. There's little emphasis on texts, and many folk tantrics are illiterate. When texts are used, the ritual instructions tend to be taken literally. The rituals are physically acted out. However, due to the lack of consistent tradition, much of popular tantra seems to be based on a sort of trial and error approach. Folk Shakta Tantra also has the well-known rituals of sex and death. As desire for sex and fear of death are understood to be two of the most powerful human instincts, meditative practice must subdue these so they do not become distractions. Both Lata Sadhana, ritual sex, and Shava Sadhana, the corpse ritual, <clears throat> involve conquest over the instincts, one by meditating during sex and one by meditating while sitting on a corpse at the burning ground. Both are part of the Virachar stage of practice, thus only performed to prove, to prove that the passions are conquered. There are also forms of these rituals that involve possession. In classical or scholastic Tantra, the goddess is symbolic of liberation or moksha and infinite consciousness. She's believed to grant the classical Tantric the gift of omniscience, brahmagyan, or liberation in response to his or her dedication or knowledge. The goddess's forms, whether beautiful or terrifying, are understood to be illusory, a part of her maya. They are used to test the tantric's worthiness, our adhikar, and knowledge. The classical tantric, and they are generally male, is usually a scholar, a pandit, a brahmin with some priestly training and knowledge of Sanskrit religious texts. He might be an academic, a teacher of Sankhya philosophy in a study circle, or a guru teaching yoga. Classical tantra has a strong literary focus and the term Tantra refers primarily to a set of texts. Rituals are generally understood to be symbolic with Tantric practice called the active aspect of the Vedanta philosophy. The classical Bengali Shakta Tantric tradition shows the influence of Patanjali Yoga, Sankhya philosophy, Shaivism, and Tantric Buddhism. It is not merely sanitized folk Shakta Tantra, it is its own tradition. We might list the top 10 set of differences between folk and classical Tantra. One, the invocation of minor or regional deities, especially goddesses, as guides in the sources of power. Such deities may be understood as family or as enemies under ritual control. This opposes the classical focus on more Sanskritic goddesses. The presence of ancestors and the dead as guides to hierarchies of spirit worlds. They may be contacted by ritual or through possession. Classical Tantra does not emphasize ancestors. Three, the transformation of energy especially the energies associated with the instincts into supernatural abilities or siddhis. Classical Tantra tends to avoid such powers. Four, the literal performance of rituals involving death and sexuality. In classical Tantra, such rituals are symbolic of philosophical concepts and not performed literally. Five, a shamanic dimension, but Tantrics of most folk varieties are consulted by community members, especially for healing and predicting the future. Classical tantrics tend to be scholars rather than healers. Six, impurity and its ritual violation is less important than communication with the deity. Such communication allows the deity to empower mantras or physical objects and to help in cases of exorcism and disease. Classical tantra avoids mediumship and possession. Seven, conquest of deities is often an important thing. If the supernatural being is hostile by nature due to its personality or its means of death, then the tantric needs to act. He or she needs to use a mantra of stronger deity to conquer the weaker one and to place it in the role of servant. Classical tantra does not support struggle with deities unless they are symbolic of the person's lower nature. Eight, dream initiation rather than initiation by the guru is frequent. The tantric guru is important if he can be found, but they are rare. And many tantrics are proceeding on their own without a guru. Classical Tantra requires initiation by a guru who is a member of a lineage and who can bestow an empowered mantra. Nine, dream instruction rather than the use of text or instruction by a guru is also frequent. Classical Tantra emphasizes knowledge of the Tantric and often the Vedic and devotional literary traditions. 10, the ascetic practices to motivate chosen deities to possess the person and thus create a bond include offering blood or flesh, 
fasting, vigils, chanting mantras at the burning ground, all are techniques to motivate the goddess to descend. In classical Tantra, such sacrifices are symbolic of surrendering the lower self to the higher self. This division into types is important in the study of Shakti Tantra, where the secondary literature on Tantra includes frequent arguments. Scholars of Tantra debate whether Tantra is really a collection of obscene rituals which are acted out by practitioners or a rational abstract philosophical system which makes use of metaphor and symbol and whose practitioners would never dream of acting out the rituals or interpreting the text literally. Understanding folk and classical Tantra as separate types or categories of Tantra allows for their study without engaging in arguments about legitimacy, authenticity, and superiority. Such arguments occur within practitioner groups as well, with competition as to the proper interpretation of ritual texts between the followers of different gurus. Shaktabhakti, the third strand. The third and most, probably most widespread strand of Shaktism is that of Shakta devotion on Bhakti. In medieval times, Shaktism was largely an esoteric religion practiced by small groups of tantric yogis until the Puranic text popularized the powers and adventures of the goddess, and later poetry portrayed her as beautiful and loving. The 18th century poet Ram Prasad Sen wrote poems and songs that showed the goddess as a loving mother and a beautiful young girl, and devotional worship grew up around those images. Devotees worshiped the goddess with great intensity, as Kalima, who may be frightening on the outside, but inwardly loving and compassionate, Tarama, who gives knowledge and liberation, and many others. Bengali Shakta Bhakti also emphasizes that the intense love of the deity is more valuable than simple obedience, thus showing the influence of Gaudi and Vaishnava ideas, where the passionate relationship between Krishna and Radha represents the ideal relationship between the god and the devotee. In Shakta Bhakti, the goddess is reached by ritual worship or puja and selfless devotional love or prema. The most popular mood or bhav is the parental mood with the goddess as mother and the devotee as child. In this monotheistic tradition, the great goddess, usually Kali, is creator, preserver, and destroyer, the most beautiful and powerful being in the universe. Shiva is usually either her consort or her creation. And in many stories, she's more powerful than he is. Devotees are saved through her grace to spend eternity in the heaven or in the lap of the goddess. We see most devotion towards the goddess Kali who is not frightening, but a loving mother who defends her children. Though her outer form is terrifying, her inner form is caring. She's transcendent, but she may descend to earth for the sake of her devotees. The goal is a close relationship with the goddess attained by spiritual love, by worship and chanting, by practices such as pilgrimage and charity, and through the goddess's grace and mercy. She may grant the devotee a good rebirth, liberation, or a place in her paradise. We may note four subtypes of Shakta Bhakti. The first subtype is folk Shakta Bhakti. This type of Bhakti is strongly influenced by folk Shaktism and has goddesses who demand worship from their followers. Simple obedience to commands is no longer enough. When she's given love, especially in the form of ritual worship and offerings, the goddess will grant happiness, wealth, victory in law cases, and good fortune to her chosen devotees. While in folk Shaktism, the goddess's primary focus is the welfare of the group, especially the tribal group. In folk Shakta Bhakti, her emphasis is upon the individual, and there's often a long and complex relationship between the goddess and her chosen worshiper. Two, the second sub subtype is emotional Shakta Bhakti. In this type, the goddess has several roles, primarily mother, but also child, friend, or sister. She expects great love and dependence from her devotees, who are most often described as her children. The most intense love in this subtype is not romantic love, but rather parent-child love. Some devotees begin with the emotion of fear towards her terrible form, but they end up loving her when they see her sweetness. The devotee loves extravagantly. He or she swings between elation and depression, loving the world because the goddess is present there or hating it because she has not appeared. The ideal attitude is total dependence, which evokes vision or darshan, in which the goddess and the devotee recognize each other. There are many miracle stories showing the goddess's love towards her chosen devotees. She blesses those who love her and she appreciates their poetry and songs. Worship may be on a small scale with household altars 
or it may be on a larger community scale with crowded shrines, jeweled statues, and sacred food piled high on silver trays at festivals such as Durga Puja and Kali Puja. Devotees read from the Puranas when they meet to sing Kali Kirtans, the songs to Kali. The third subtype of Shakta Bhakti is political Shakta Bhakti, or Shakta nationalism. In this type, the goddess represents the land. She's Mother India, Bharat Mata, or Bharat Devi. She is like the folk Shakta goddess who represents the village, but on a larger scale. She calls upon her children to rescue her when the land is in trouble, and they do so by protest, war, revolution, or other political actions. From the mid 19th century, the goddess has become a symbol of Indian nationalism and the divine mother who is herself the land of India. The goddess evokes patriotism and mother India is understood to be both a poetic image and a real entity. We see elements of folk shaktism in the regional identification of the goddess and a shakta bhakti in which the goddess expects devotion. Its philosophy is primarily pantheism where the goddess is imminent within the earth and especially within the land of India. She is not a distant supernatural entity. She suffers when the land suffers. The goal is to rescue the mother and create a good world. Its ideals are ethical rather than supernatural. This path is the affirmation of truth and liberty and willingness to fight for ideals. The fourth subtype of Shakta Bhakti is Shakta Universalism or Shakta Vedanta. This view became widespread among Indian Shaktas with the popularity of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and his disciple Vivekananda in the late 19th century. It's also an important perspective among Shaktas outside of India, especially in the United States and Europe. In this approach, emotional bhakti is linked with classical tantra. And we have Ramakrishna's description of the goddess as a loving mother who is also infinite consciousness. It combines aspects of devotional Shaktism with a focus on knowledge and Vedanta philosophy, and also the Brahmo Samaj protests against the limitations of caste status. Though the mother is the ideal symbol for Brahman, other deities and symbols may also represent it. This follows some of Ramakrishna's statements about the mother being his chosen form of universal awareness, though other paths may also lead to God. This goddess is not a jealous goddess. The altar of a Shakti universalist may have the symbols of many deities and religions. The goddess is equivalent to Brahman, but with an emphasis on creativity, education, and action in the world, service to others. This type of bhakti seeks to incorporate newer and non-traditional ideas. And modern writings sometimes describe Shakta Bhakti meditation as experimental and scientific. As ultimately all roads lead to the same goal, the practice of other religions is acceptable. For Ramakrishna claimed to have attained realization through other paths, such as Vaishnavism, Islam, and Christianity. Modern popular Shakta Vedanta echoes this sentiment, saying that the ultimate aim of all religions is the same. We thus see many understandings of Shaktism. Part of the problem in studying Shaktism from the perspective of ethnography is the issue of definition. What is it and who belongs to it? You need to define a population in order to observe it. When I first did field work in West Bengal, I began by acting, asking local informants for many traditions how one could tell who was a Shakta. During several initial months of interviews with people who were identified as Shaktas by others and who defined themselves as practicing Shaktas, I heard these top 10 answers as the major responses. So for who is a Shakta? One, one who calls himself or herself a Shakta. Two, one who has Kali or Durga as his personal deity or Ishta Devi. Three, one who has any other goddess as his or her personal deity. Four, one who describes his or her family as Shakta. Five, one whose family priest or Kula Guru is Shakta. Six, one who has taken Shakta initiation or Diksha with a Shakta mantra. Seven, one who has private personal faith in a goddess or goes to visit Shakta shrines or Shakta peaks. Eight, one who celebrates Durga and Kali Puja, especially in the family home. Nine, one who has had a special call from a goddess, often to perform some act. And 10, one who has had a vision, darshan of the goddess while awake or in a dream. Definitions of Shakta membership are fluid and there are many areas of disagreement. Can one be a Shakta without initiation? Can one be a Shakta with a Vaishnava family background? 
Can one be a Shakta if he performs rituals without faith in the goddess? Can the Muslims who construct the great pandals for Durga Puja and Kali Puja worship her for safety while working? Uh, can they be called Shaktas? Some urban gurus and high caste practitioners with whom I've spoken have tried to narrow the definitions of who's a Shakta. False Shaktas are people who are uneducated, who have not read the major texts of the Shakta Tantric tradition. True Shaktas are educated, literate, and understand the goddess to be merely a manifestation of Brahman through the Sankhya category of active matter or property. People who claim to be Shaktas who only worship their village goddesses are merely ignorant and not really Shaktas. They think their goddess image is alive and that their goddess is an individual who cares for them rather than a philosophical principle. We see boundary lines and emphasis upon differences a distinguishing between educated insider shakta and superstitious outsider non-shakta. For this Brahmanic perspective, often found among Western educated shaktas, the boundaries of true shaktism extend to the educated elite and the followers. For other practitioners, shaktism is defined differently. Pandits studying dead ideas are not real shaktas. Only people who have faith in the goddess, who sense her presence, or have her vision, they are true shaktas. Shaktism is devotion to the goddess, and true shaktas are those who love her and are chosen by her. Lack of love is the boundary, especially as seen in people who are untrue to that other important goddess, Paratmata, or the homeland in India. Thus, there are many local definitions. Caretakers of shakta temples and shrines divine shaktism in terms of temple ritual. Who comes to the temples? Who pays for goddess worship? Who gives offerings at the shrines? Shakta gurus define shaktism in terms of lineage. To what sampradaya do people belong? Are their mantras empowered? Are they doing their kriyas and rituals? Shakti healers define shaktism in terms of abilities and results. Does the goddess listen to the person's requests and prayers? Does she come in dreams and call the person to follow her instructions? Householder shaktas define shaktism in terms of devotional behavior. How much time does the person find to perform rituals? How much food is given? How many silk saris and ornaments are offered to the statue? How many relatives are invited? There are professional, institutional, regional, and even eccentric individual definitions. <coughs> the issue of definition has been a problem for a long time. As W.J. Wilkins states back in his 1901 book, Modern Hinduism, it has been estimated that of the Hindus in Bengal, about three fourths are devoted to the worship of Shakti i.e. the power or energy of God as represented in many female forms. Of the remaining quarter, three parts are Vaishnavas and the remainder mostly Shaivas. Each deity has his consort to whom the worship of the people is often more freely given than to her husband. As without the female, the male is unproductive and she is regarded as the real force in nature, hence the almost exclusive adoration that is paid to the female deities by so many. Writing in 1907, John Campbell Oman also estimates the three quarters of Bengalis are shaktas. However, modern estimates vary wildly. According to one researcher interviewed on Bengali folk art and culture, in one sense, all Bengalis are shaktas. But if we were to estimate how many people were ardent worshippers of the goddess Kali and worship no other deity, I would estimate about 10% of the West Bengal population. On the other hand, a modern professor of history and Bengali shakta expert also interviewed claimed that almost 90% of West Bengal is shakta. This gives us a shakta population approximately ranging from 8 million to almost 80 million. Clearly, the estimates can range wildly. Then we have the issue of syncretism, both with other forms of Hinduism and with Islam, especially in healing rituals. I spoke with a local Hindu leader in Calcutta. I asked him how he understood the difference between Hindu and Muslim. He said that they were the same dharma, they just had different sampradayas. Both traditions were thus legitimate religions, but they had different spiritual teachers who gave rituals and initiations. Thus we see that not only Shaktism, but Hinduism itself can easily merge into other traditions. One way to better understand these types of Shaktism is to look at informants who reflect them. So I will give three examples. For the folk tribal strand, I gave a Santal woman who got divine calls from a Hindu goddess. Parvati Soran is a Santal tribal woman who lives in a village outside of Shantinikaitan in Birbhum. She's about 40 years old, though she appears younger. 
with dark skin and a bright smile. She primarily worships Manisha, a Hindu goddess, and she keeps a large statue of Manisha surrounded by sacred stones. She proudly states that her stones and statues are more alive than gods made only of mud. And she respects that life by giving fruit and flower offerings. While most Santalis prefer to worship the traditional Santal bangas or deities, Parvati received a call which resulted in her adoption of folk shaktism. As a child, she saw snakes in visions and dreams. And when she traveled to other villages, the snakes would lead her places. She often spoke with them. The snake visions began when she was seven or eight years old, and they were especially vivid whenever she had fevers. As a note, Hindu visions may be considered as a form of upward religious mobility for Santals. Acting in the fashion of the Hindus, the high profile majority in India, can be seen as higher status than acting like a Santal. Tribals generally do not consider themselves to be Hindus, and they're not considered to be so by caste Hindus, though this is changing with the BJP's concern with having a Hindu majority in India. Thus, a call from a Hindu deity may put a tribal person into a liminal and in some ways privileged position. The issue of status also arises in the area of possession by deities. Other residents of Parvati's village said she was often possessed and called her a female Oja, tribal healer. But Parvati denied this, saying that she was a devotee, a bhakta of the goddess. Possession or poor is considered to be a low status act, while devotion is high status. She said of her life, I grew up in this village and I married when I was 18 years old. After I got married, I got a fever and I was very ill. I could not leave my bed for four months. I was so sick that I couldn't eat, even rice or water, because my body was in great pain. When I was delirious, I would speak to the goddess Manisha. She would come to visit me and I could see her. I would worship her even while I was unconscious. I saw Manisha frequently and eventually I began to worship her. My health improved, but my hair became matted and looked like honeycombs hanging down. I was suffering from recurring fevers. And Manisha said, if you don't worship me, you'll never get well. When I did, my fever began to subside. Why do I worship Manisha, not the Santal gods? Manisha came to me, God, only the gods know why. Manisha helps me to cure people, and I give them roots which make them better. I ask Manisha what to do. I say to her, you've made me worship you. Now tell me what to do. Then Manisha will appear to me and tell me which roots to use. And then I go and find them and I give them to people. I give them in her name, but I don't chant any mantras over them. Sometimes I see Durga and Kali also, but I don't accept them. I tell them in the vision or darshan, the word she used for vision, that I cannot worship them. I tell them that maintaining Manisha is expensive enough for me. How can I afford your puja with the little money that I have? They get angry, but I say, how can I meet the expense? What money I had was used up when I was first very ill. Then Durga and Kali were angry at me for not worshiping them. They argue with me at night, but I always tell them I don't have the money. Recently, I started asking them for money. I tell them, give me some money and then I'll worship you. But so far, they don't listen. Though she's been a devotee of Manisha for about 20 years informally, she's only been a professional healer for about four years. She enjoys doing ritual worship and healing, though they involve her fasting for several days. She's developing a reputation as a healer in the Hindu community outside of Shantanikate. And several informants, both tribal and Hindu, in the area called her the most devoted woman that they know. For Shakta Tantric practitioners, we have the example of Jaya Shrima, who asked me to use her religious title rather than her name in writing. She's a teacher and she must hide her tantric identity to keep her job. For Jaya Shrima, Tantra Guru Ma of a group of devotees, Tantra Sadhana is a way of getting a fused identity with the goddess, which lasts over a lifetime. Jayashree was initiated by her tantric guru while they sat on matched sets of human skulls. And with the mantra came the direct entrance of the goddess Adya Shakti into her heart. The mantras, mudras, yantras, and rituals were ways of preparing her body for Shakti's entrance. Union with Adya Shakti is the highest possible state, for she is identical with Brahman and the mother of the universe. Jayashree came from a tantric family, and her guru was a tantric who practiced secretly. Jayashri too practices in an underground fashion, for religious practitioners, especially tantrics, are persecuted by the communist authorities in her area. 
She had many health problems, but the ascent of the goddess out of her heart and into full consciousness blots these away. And she becomes aware of nothing but the goddess's love and power. She's a celibate tantric guru who no longer needs to perform rituals because the goddess already lives in her heart. At the age of 13, when Jaya Shri began going to temples for worship, she would fall into trances. And her word for this is samadhi. During worship, she would see Tarama and Adyama before her. She had frequent visions and trance states. When Adyama would come, the world turned to light and she would fall unconscious. Or she phrased that her senses would be lost, drowned in dhyan. When she was 17 years old, her guru was transferred to Allahabad with the IAS and he took her with him for a year. He instructed her in meditation and they did mantra and visualization before Adyama on matching Panchamundi asanas, the seats made of five skulls. She sat next to him and he transmitted his power to her. The power passed directly from heart to heart. And after this ritual with her guru, Adya Shakti was there and within Jayashri permanently. About a year later, her father was transferred to Shuri in West Bengal and she came there to live with her family. She wanted to take vows of renunciation or sannyas, but her guru said that she'd already become a renunciant inwardly, so no such vow was necessary. She was to be a householder holy woman, a grihi shandika. And she got a college degree and studied classical music, but her illnesses restricted her movement and eventually made her stop her education. She stayed in Shuri after her father's death, but never married and now lives with her brother. She's weak from heart trouble and eats little food. The doctor she saw when she first became ill told her she'd be dead in 10 years, but she has survived 25 years thus far. This is understood as a miracle by her devotees. Her guru prayed to Adyama to let her survive and help others, and she has done so. After her practice with the guru, she also developed some abilities at mediumship. She mentioned being possessed by Mirabai, Anuradha Thakur, Trilanga Swami, and Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Adya Shakti Kali is always there, and Shiva often visits. These beings speak through her, and they give information to her disciples. She keeps a journal of their works. She also has a close relationship with her guru, even though he's dead. She says, whenever I feel love, he comes to me. When I'm sleeping, he comes and strokes my head. The guru always knew when she was in pain from her illness, and this would cause him pain. She says, now I do not feel that I'm in a human body. Instead, I am Shakti. I feel that I am Adyama. I am the mother and all creation is my child. If you do meditation, you too can realize that you are really Adyama. Ma divided herself throughout creation and everybody has a piece of the goddess inside. In the end, all will come back together and everybody will become the goddess. This is to occur at the end of the Kali Yuga, the time of universal destruction. Because this time is coming, Adyakali has been withdrawing sadhus from the world for their prayers and meditation avert the time of destruction. The end times may come only when there are no more sadhus to pray and meditate. During interviews, Jaya Shri Ma would sit quietly while her mostly male disciples would praise her. And she speaks of the goddesses present in everyone as their highest awareness. She pulled me aside, stared deeply into my eyes and said that Adya Shakti Kali was deep within me. And if I would seek her, I would see her in my heart. She was my true self and the true self of us all. She had no territoriality in relation to the goddess and she wanted everyone to recognize the goddess's presence. For the Bhakti example, I give a male singer of Kali Kirtan from the Kolkata, Kolkata, well, to say Calcutta area. Anna Chattopadhyaya, I use the first initial because he asked to remain anonymous with the first initial, is a talented professional singer who follows Shakta Bhakti. He describes his life. I worship Kali and also Shiva and Krishna. All three are my family deities, and I do puja to them every day. Though all gods and goddesses are ultimately the same, still Kali is more alive to me and more appealing than the others. She is like a mother or friend who guards her devotee and guides him, protecting him from danger. I also see her in her Sarashi form as a beautiful 16-year-old girl. A part of the goddess can descend into people who then can act on the goddess's behalf, often without realizing it. For me, the goddess's presence is recognized by the mood of love, bhakti love, which she evokes. 
his experiences tend to deal with sound and emotion. I've never had a vision of the goddess, but I've had the inner sense of her presence, which he calls Anubhav. At such times, my voice chokes and it becomes impossible to sing. I get drowned in feelings, sometimes while singing alone in my room, but it gets more awkward in public performances. It's very embarrassing. I know several cases of singers overcome by emotion towards the goddess while singing before audiences. Some were at festivals in front of thousands of people. Another was on all India radio where the singer was too choked up to sing his second song. Religious experience in public is embarrassing. He calls the song that he sings Bhakti Giti or songs of devotion or Bhav Sangeet, songs of religious emotion or mood. Some Kali songs deal with ritual practice or Satna Sangeet, but he prefers those with greater emotional content. He says, devotion is more important than ritual worship of the goddess. Priests today tend to be commercial and want money and offerings. Puja has become a trade. In the account books for Puja today, the least expense is for offering to the deity, while more money goes for flashy surroundings, lighting, and advertising. Often the tradition remains, but the feelings are gone and the focus is on appearances. Such rituals are only superficial. As Nasrul Islam said, I've done puja to you, Ma, and you didn't appear, for you only come when I cry. Ram Prasad said, if you do puja with grandeur and pride, all you'll have is pride, it's just a show. Krishna told Narada, I'm not in heaven, not in rituals, but in the heart. In terms of his childhood, my interest in music started from my school days in the 1950s. I came from a religious family. My father and mother were devotees and my younger sister was a singer. There were many rituals in the house of which the largest was worship of the goddess Jagadatri. I learned from professional Kali Kirtaniyas who are famous in Bengal and later began singing for the large goddess festivals in Calcutta and nearby areas. I also sang for Vaishnava holidays, but I do not feel that this offends Kali. All are the same deity, Kali and Krishna are simply different forms as earrings and bracelets are gold in different shapes. All forms are equal, all castes are equal. The goddess makes no distinction between Brahmins and others. As to the importance of the audience, rapport with listeners and the goddess is the foundation of a Kirtaniya's bliss. Kali is known through singing and through feelings and dreams and in the sense of presence, as if someone is behind the scenes behind a set of curtains, watching with loving eyes. Conclusion. Aside from Wiccan worship of the Earth Mother and Christian offshoots worshiping Mary Magdalene, in the West we hear most about the worship of the goddess or Shakti in terms of tantric sexual practice. Tantric sex takes the literal aspect of folk Shakti Tantra, but reverses its goals. Rather than transcending the body, one seeks to enter more deeply into it, creating valley orgasms that last for hours, emphasizing the importance of bodily pleasure rather than transcendent deities. Some of this had to do with Rajneesh, who called Tantra the yoga of love for his neo sannyasins Groups like Hawaiian goddess Tantra, Oceanic Tantra with its dolphin breath orgasm, and Red Indian Tantra adopted Rajneesh's Western Tantra and then elaborated it, adding possession by the goddess as a technique for bringing pleasure. Modern entrepreneurs have added Shakti rituals to the ever-growing area of wellness, which has already devoured humanistic and transpersonal psychology, as well as various Asian meditational practices. But now their goal is to make people more attractive and live longer, rather than gain Brahma again or love of the goddess. India has adopted a bit of this. Bengali informants told me about a Pashu chakra in North Calcutta, where the goal was to become an animal rather than a god. They suggested that I avoid attending this ritual and refused to tell me where it was. Thus we see India is creating its own ritual reversals. There are also new spas opening in the Himalayas seeking an international clientele with Shakta Tantric rituals to attract wealthy customers and those who want to live a life like the rock singer Sting. Shaktism can be studied from many perspectives. I found the ethnographic approach most interesting for the diversity revealed in the lives of its practitioners. Thank you.